everybody. Now we start the serious stuff. So what I'm here to talk to you about, and I'm really happy to talk to you about it, uh, is about everything that is quantum and why you should be interested in it or at least know a little bit about it and what it means actually for our industry and how it's actually kind of revolutionary in terms of what's happening right now. And the reason I care about it is because I'm the Chief Information Security Officer of KPN Telecom. Again, it's the incumbent telecommunications provider. It's kind of like the Telecom Italia of Italy. So we've been around for over 100 years. We'd like to be here for 100 more. But that means we have to fundamentally redesign the way we think about our network and our security. So let's talk about why that is so. First of all, um, you know, and I've been presenting this quite long, so I, I'm going to warn you about that. You might, if you've seen some of my other talks, you'll see some things that you've seen before. But I've done some new stuff in here. What, the point is that I've been doing this for quite some time, but it's never been more current than right now. And the reason is because, you know, we talk about this all the time about in intelligence agencies, pretty much knowing everything there is to know about you. They know who you are, where you work, who you talk to, how you live. But it's not just really designated to just them. It's a lot of places where we think we're moving and transacting with each other privately, which is absolutely not the case. But intelligence agencies specifically have made it their modus operandi to keep trying to gain more and more of a foothold in how they process the information that constitutes our daily lives. And the interesting thing about it is, in Europe, we've been very like, preoccupied with how we engineer privacy. And specifically, if you look at the legislation in Germany and the context in Germany, you would think that as EU citizens, we are more privacy-minded than anything else. That's not quite true. It's not true, because when it actually comes down to like, how we are uh, changing our society, to do signals intelligence gathering and actually gather all this information, it's not true. So really, they've been able to do this for quite some time. And when you know, they worry, they worry about one thing and one thing only. And it's cryptography. And they refer to cryptography as the going dark problem. So imagine that everything is lit up in terms of the data that they're looking for. The only times they can't get to that data is when the encryption around it is so strong that they actually can't bypass it or find another loophole. Does anybody know what encryption technology to this day the NSA claims still not to be able to hack? PGP. How many of you regularly use PGP? And that's my point. None of you use PGP. And this is the one thing that they can't get into. And then you have to ask yourself, why the heck not? Well, it's because PGP you know, is a fundamental problem when it comes to us being able to use it at scale. Because if you want to use it, somebody on the other side who you want to communicate with also has to have it in place. All right, what, what is the most secure um, method of communication that you use? Signal. Yeah, Signal's not bad. It's using Axolotl. It's, it's implemented well. Yeah, Signal's not bad. I like Signal. I, I still sometimes you know, worry about like canaries and logs and uh, all the other network elements that would still allow you to do some sort of traffic analysis. Because traffic anal just because you have crypto doesn't mean you take away all of the traffic analysis components. But, but that's a really good uh, program. So what I do see, though, is, is this kind of answer that we're giving now is kind of reflected in our society, but even less so, because at least there's a couple of you using Signal. But the majority of us don't actually give a shit. The majority of us can read the Snowden revelations, know about the intelligence agencies doing this, and actually not care. They don't care. And the majority of the reasons they don't care is they either hide between one of two things. They either say, you know what, I have nothing to hide, or they do something else and they say, well, I may have something to hide, but I, you know, it's fine. It's the government. I don't mind the government seeing all my secret files. And usually we only get upset when it comes to very specific information. And there's a great John Oliver video uh, where he talks about the fact that uh, the government sometimes also sees like pornographic or nude material, you know, dick pics is how he refers to it. And that there, when the public knows that that's allowed, that's when they get and tend to get upset. But other than that, we don't do anything. And what we're seeing globally is a renewal of crypto wars, which means that 
When we don't know how to break the crypto, we're trying to find other mechanisms to weaken it. So when you take a look at the NSA programs, they've actually been very open and clear that they are doing things around developing uh, programs and attempts to break quantum computing, um, or rather quantum cryptography with quantum computing, but their efforts at the time of the release of the Snowden documents were actually really insignificant, and they're actually looking for other ways to thwart the strong cryptography that's being used globally. And, you know, like right now, I have to tell you, I miss James Comey. He's like, Comey's my homie kind of thing. Um, and it's because of the fact of what ha is happening now with Trump. But when you take a look at all of the different global legislation that's being made, we're actually having a different sense of priorities than trying to protect ourselves. Our priority now is signals intelligence gathering, which means that we would rather gather all the traffic of everybody else than protect our own infrastructure security. So globally speaking, we are back to where we started in the 1990s, which is a war that we thought we won, which were the original crypto wars. How many of you are old enough to remember the crypto wars? No? Okay, that's a sad commentary on age. But um, the clue, and I'm not looking at the old people, I really am not, I'm, I'm not. But, uh, but the clue is that the original crypto wars were basically requirements for when you were allowed to export crypto. So a lot of you are developers. Imagine you develop this awesome new tool for how you use PGP, that you can communicate with everyone on every medium completely securely. But then you found out you could only use it in your own country. You are not allowed to send it to somebody else outside of Italy. That was the original crypto war. So if you wanted to use strong cryptography at the time in the 90s outside of the United States, you had to apply for an export license because it fell under the category of a dual-use good, which means it could be used for good, but it could also be used for bad. So crypto wasn't just being used by the good guys, it was also being used by the bad guys. And I have one thing to say to that. Duh, right? Of course it is. But everything we do now in technology is a dual-use good. Imagine having that type of legislation for all of the stuff that we do. If you were using a scanning tool to scan for vulnerability, is that a dual-use good? If there are brand new tools to do remote code execution and you want to find that in your own software to make it more secure, imagine that that would be banned. So this kind of thinking is really like limited to policy people who don't understand the technology. But this was the war that was fought and won by technologists in the 1990s and it's coming back because we don't know how to deal with cryptography that cannot be broken by law enforcement agencies. So as a result, these law enforcement agencies want to make sure it isn't available to everyone, even now, even today, or maybe even especially today. So the other thing that we're trying to do, and you, you might remember that from that iPhone case and Apple and what was happening with the FBI. So Comey tried to pressure Apple to give him the certificate signing key for iOS so that he could actually push a new software update to the Apple iPhone. Do you guys remember this? San Bernardino, terrorist, bang, bang, bad, ooh, right? Okay. Sorry, that was my quick, uh, yeah, I know, that was really silly. But the point is, um, there were a whole bunch of other mechanisms at his disposal. You know, he had the NSA, BFF. He could have asked them to do a ton of other things, from hardware laser glitching to try to read the chip you know, bit by bit and try to figure out what was on there to get the, the lock code. He could have done so many other things, which he didn't do because he rather would have fought the case legally to create precedent with that case. They had all the material already ready. He just wanted to use that case to find a way to get in, okay? And finally, what did they do? They went to an Israeli company and they bought a back door. You guys are developers. How would you feel about a really cool tool that you made that was used by everybody and that there being a backdoor that you never knew about, that would weaken the trust of your tool, of your application, of, of anything that you would create. How many of you w for, okay, and I'm gonna put it really black and white now, it's not black and white, but I'm gonna make it black and white. For the purpose and interest of national security, how many of you would prefer having backdoors in your stuff? How many of you would like put one in for the government? Ah, it's, it's a fair question. I'm making it very black and white. 
How many of you think that you don't know who the good guy is, and so a black door could be used by the bad guy? Okay, you can't put your hand up twice, dude. <laughs> it was black or white. It was like one or the other. But you know what I'm... I'm exactly, it's very gray. And this is the problem. This is the fundamental dilemma that we've got to deal with. Because really, like, it requires a certain amount, and thank you for doing that, because you were my guinea pig now. It requires a certain amount of magical thinking, of like unicorns that poop daisies, in order for this to work. You can't put backdoors in and guarantee that you are the only one that will ever have found it and knows how to use it. So it just doesn't work. So when we look at the intelligence regulations, you know, we saw a whole bunch of crap happen, happened all over the world. You would think, okay, everybody's going to now learn, they're going to change, we're going to do it differently. No, we don't. And we evade that kind of thing. And what we have instead is we have global legislation that tends again to not worrying about how do we protect it from those backdoors being abused by others. We're more concerned about how do we build it in ourselves. Yeah. And what I was really worried about, like in the Netherlands, I'm just going to give you an example of Maximo's home territory now. So uh, in the Netherlands, what uh, is happening is there's a huge referendum that just happened regarding the law on the intelligence services. And what this law was allowing is for mass surveillance. It actually says explicitly in the law, you are allowed to conduct mass surveillance. So previously, law intelligence agencies were doing targeted surveillance. So you're the, uh, you're in my, now we agreed, you're my guinea pig, it's like poster child. So if we all agree we want to tap this guy, we're all cool with it, right? One guy, it's a one guy's problem, but it's good, for, it's good for all of us because he's the terrorist. We want to tap him, we all agree. Everybody agree with that? Right? Because that's proportional. We agree if there's one bad guy in the room, we could tap him, right? But now we're saying something different. We're saying we don't know anymore who the bad guy is, so we need to gather all the traffic on everybody, and we'll figure it out later. And by the way, we're going to keep that traffic for an ever and ever. And you got to trust us, I got this. I got the security. Don't worry. Leave it to me. I'm the government. I'm really good at security. Right? Okay, now, you, I heard some giggles, but that's how we all think, because it requires a perfect technical implementation, and it requires flawless process execution, which means that the process can never deviate or vary from case to case when you actually conduct mass surveillance and when you're actually keeping all this data for a very long time open, and you have to have the court orders to make sure that you're looking for the right things at the right time. Right? How many of you would trust your government with such a capability? En masse, everybody gets tapped. Your information and dick pics included. All right, and that's my point. So in the Netherlands, we had a referendum. It was really close. It was like 48% to 46%. 48% were against such a capability. But this nearly became law. And initially, the president of the Netherlands actually said, and he's not a president, he's a premier, but it doesn't matter, but he said, when the referendum comes out and it's negative, I'm going to ignore it. So I don't care what the people want. We need this. Our intelligence services need this. So I'm going to ignore that opinion of all of the rest of you. And, you know, the clue is now they're going to take it back and they're going to do a little bit of overhaul, but the fundamental need to do this is based on the fact that all my friends are doing it. And this sounds like a little kid. They're all going to the party and the rock concert, so why can't I? So that's why they want to have this capability. And it also means that in order to have this capability, what they're going to do is build, which they already did, a bit of, zero days, but they're also going to buy them. And if you think the law and the intelligence services is bad, what I find even more terrifying is that it extends, in the majority of countries, it's not just this one geography, to the same capability for the police forces. And we're not talking about the super elite police, we're talking about the regular police. That the regular police forces also want the ability to hack both within their borders, within like the Netherlands, for example, but also outside. They're allowed to attack, hack, any automated object, so even a Fitbit, anything, both w or this pointer, anything from both within and outside of the Netherlands. Okay? And obviously, it's difficult to attack things sometimes. 
not all the time, but if someone, your opponent, has good security, if they've applied all their patches, if they've done all their updates, if they've hired architects and they know what they're doing with their system design and development and they've got their shit in, under control, then basically what that means is it's hard to find a way to breach them. Okay? And for those targets, what they want to do is they want to buy a zero day from whoever on the white market, and when there's a black market, what they want to do, and this is actually in the legislation, they want to look at how to make the black market more white markety. Okay? Here's the best part. The NSA has something that the other kids in school don't have. The NSA has a dual mandate. On the one side, they are tasked with doing signal intelligence gathering. That means gathering all the communications up of all the other countries, of course Italy, but all of the other countries. You know, with the five eyes and the nine eyes, that's their job. They've got this thing to gather up all the other communications. But the second mandate they have is information assurance, which means while they've got to gather up everybody else's traffic, they've got to make sure that the traffic in the United States is kept secure. That dual mandate isn't as well executed by all the other intel agencies. That's the problem. The problem is in the United States, the NSA is actually pretty darn good at keeping their own shit down and under control. Even though we've had some spontaneously horrible hacks, you, you do get the idea that they have that mandate and they actually try to make sure that the vital critical infrastructure is better protected. They do a lot of threat and tell, they do a lot of work on that, and as a result, you know, they're okay. But the problem with this is that actually globally speaking, when we see that countries like the US are do this, what it means is we tend to freak out, especially when it comes to using American products and networks. So it means like when you saw the Angela Merkel case, right? Remember the Blackberry of Angela Merkel? Okay. So when that was supposed to be tapped, what was the instantaneous knee-jerk response? Anybody? Okay, when we hear that uh, Facebook is doing this, what's the instantaneous response? What? Yes, we knew it. Okay, I knew it, you knew it, I know. But my point is, when we hear about this stuff, the instantaneous knee-jerk response from the masses is to stop using Facebook, right? So, like in China, they have the, their alternative, which is, and I forgot what it is, it's not WeChat, it's, um, because that's WhatsApp alternative. They have an alternative to Facebook, which, whose name I'm forgetting now, and, uh, what is it called? You go? Wavo. Okay, so that's what they use instead of Facebook, and my point is, it results in a nationalistic opinion, like, of how we use products. So we don't want to go global with all of our products and services. We want to kind of break that model of the internet and how we share products and services and tools. And we want to go, okay, I don't trust that from that country. They spy on me, so I use something local. Very often, the local things are not as good in quality, in security, in you know, functionality. They're just, eh, wah. So it's not always a better choice. And the same thing is happening across the internet. When we see this kind of mass surveillance and stuff, we don't want to have our data centers located there. We don't want to take part in cloud services. We don't want to you know, have the Cloud Act enabled. We want to create like local little national splinter nets, which splinter off the rest of the internet. And this, for all of us, for all of you, for me, is a bad, bad thing. And this is the thing that we should really be fighting. What we should be doing is building in trust and privacy and security into those fundamental protocols and preventing this kind of crap legislation. Um, and what I you know, really think is like all of this ability, we've called this you know, to hack other countries and other automated devices, it's called hack back legislation. So you hack me, I hack you back. This is not a very mature or educatedly elevated principle of how we work but that's what it is. And it prevents us all from having continuous networks and services. It's actually gonna cause DDoSs on, for example, the DNS infrastructure that we have. So you, some of you might know that one of the most vulnerable parts of the global internet is the domain name services, right? Everybody knows this? So imagine a, a DDoS on K root, or, or K root and L root. Europe will be screwed if we have that. So the idea should be that we should be bolstering that type of vulnerable and critical infrastructure across the board. And you know, we're doing all of this, remember again, for this guy, 
for one target, we're willing to compromise all of those other principles that we hold so dear. So that's why I call it the three musketeers principle, all for one, one for all. Except we're all screwed. Um, and when we start out, and it's just the intelligence services, we think, you guys all voted. Like, I think that's OK. I would build in a back door. You, you voted that you would, right? You'd build in that back door for the intelligence service to catch a bad guy. But would you still build in the back door for your local police to do it? How many of you would still do it then? No. So it trickles down. It never remains in that one group. It may start out there, but eventually the script kitty, your neighbor who's annoying and 15 and has all those pimples and wants to impress the girls, he's going to use it too. So it's going to start with a vulnerability that starts there, and it trickles all the way down. Anybody have a really good example of that? There's a really good example of that that happened recently. Come on, guys. What happened recently, last uh, summer, uh, where we had like global in infrastructure freakout? Somebody have an iPhone? Like, what is MS1710? Come on. Come on. No, seriously. Yeah, go ahead. The what? Not the iCloud hack. That, that's a good. So MS1710, that should have given it away. MS stands for? Right. Uh, come on, guys. Really? All right. Now, I want you guys to know this. But what I want to talk about before we go into here, what I want to talk about is the fact that the NSA developed Eternal Blue. Do you guys know Eternal Blue? You know WannaCry? Right, OK. OK, so well, let's talk about this for one second before we go into everything quantum. So the, the NSA developed WannaCry. How many of you knew this? Only one of you. That's not a good sign. All right, here's the clue. So the NSA needs to do all of the stuff we talk about here and here, OK? They want to have zero days that will take down the internet and bypass all of the encryption. In order to do that, they need to build this stuff up. So they either build it up themselves or they hire someone else to build it. NSA always needs to like, have that capacity on hand, so they also outsource sometimes. They outsourced it to a group called the Equation Group. OK, this is the, the title that we give them you know, in threat intelligence frameworks all over the world. So the equation group is sitting there building all these happy zero days. And uh, they're using it on common platforms. Because why would you bother to try to break the unbreakable encryption if you can just screw around with SMB on Windows right? and get to the traffic anyway? So uh, what they did is they built a zero day, a backdoor. And uh, they thought it was just for them. It managed to get leaked because there was a hack of the equation group by another group calling themselves the Shadow Brokers, who hacked basically all the zero-day toolkits that the NSA was building by this one group. And what they did was really, really cool. Uh, like Donald Trump, they liked Twitter. And they put an auction up on Twitter. And they said, anybody who wants to buy these zero days, come over here. So you can, you can actually now, even now, follow the Shadow Brokers account on Twitter. And they basically put it up for auction for $10 million. Some of you are looking at me like you don't believe me. But seriously, go look Google Shadow Brokers, Google this stuff, because it's all actually happening. And the worry that I have is we don't know, know about it. So as a result, we tend to be less careful with our security and privacy and, and less clued in about why we need to garner and protect those things so closely. So why does this all matter? Because the thing that we're trying to fix here is cryptography. And the way that we're going to fix it is really we're going to address a brand new challenge that's coming up from quantum computing. Why should we care? Because of the fact that actually, like, Let's first talk about quantum. What is quantum? It really is the area of quantum mechanics, which is divergent from classical physics. So if you say you know, classical physics is stuff that we all know, Newton drops ball, action, reaction, causality, we get that. Quantum mechanics is completely different. It's a science that started roughly in the 1920s. Uh, there was a Solvay conference. Uh, Einstein and Bohr got grumpy with each other. They disagreed. And that's kind of where we refer to as the birth of quantum mechanics because of all the discussions that were happening with these prominent physicists uh, at the Solvay conference. It's not like that action-reaction, you know, very clear causal deterministic relationship. It's much more probabilistic, which means I dropped the ball. It could drop, but it also may not drop. 
And that sounds crazy, but this was always like one of the fundamental counterintuitive kind of principles around quantum mechanics. It's highly probabilistic. You do something, and something may happen, and something else may also happen. And it's that duality that makes it a little bit difficult for us to kind of be like, no, 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 it does happen. And the clue is we know when things happen when we measure them. And that's why it's so important that there's this observer that actually measures which of the probabilistic things actually turned out to happen. Yeah? Have I confused you so far? No? Give me one more shot. All right. So everybody knows what a bit is, right? A bit is a zero or a one. Yeah? A qubit is a zero and a one simultaneously because they're superpositioned. So usually a bit is like a photon, which is polarized. You know, it can be polarized like, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, horizontally. Oh, that's horizontally. <laughs> horizontally or vertically. Or if you imagine like a, a, a qubit, you know, it has a spin up or a spin down. Okay? And they usually exist in this very like tight state. They're superpositioned. So if this one would spin down, then this one would spin up. So they're always existing in this like dualistic but superposition state. So where you have a bit and you know, like you know, if you have a bit and you're writing a bit in code, you know it's a zero or a one, right? But imagine, I need you to imagine for a moment. Imagine that instead of having or, or, you have and, and. Are we all imagining this? Because I need that imagination to be like, oh, they're both for the next thing, because the clue is a quantum computer actually use qubits in an entangled state, which means that we kind of pair them together, and we pair them together regardless of length. This was one of these fundamental things that Einstein didn't like, by the way, but we pair them together regardless of the distance between these qubits. And the reason that I need you to imagine that so well a minute ago is because when we entangle the qubit, so, you know, we had that qubit that was like this, right? And now we're going to entangle it with another qubit on the other side, which is down up. All right? And it's like permanently connected to that. Now, in the space of where we had a bit, like a 0 or a 1, we now have a 0 and a 1 with the other qubit, a 0 and a 1 again. So instead of having one thingy there, we now got four thingies with entanglement. Are you with me? Because you look really unhappy, confused. You're like, no! You don't want to accept this, but accept this for a moment, okay? Like, suspend the disbelief and think that that's what's so cool about a quantum computer. If you could imagine, like, places in memory or um, things that occupy space, okay? So to make it more tangible to how we think, yeah. It doesn't have, so the, it, there's actually two states that we talk about, but imagine that a qubit has that two-state dualistic superposition thing, okay? So it only has two. It's only when we entangle it with another qubit, then it has four. Yes. So every time you entangle more and more qubits, what happens? Go ahead, say it again. Bang, bang, exponential. So if we say, all right, well, I'm going to ask you to do this because I don't need to understand it, you do. All right, well, we both need to understand it. But um, so tell me, if I uh, have... Like three qubits, what do I have? How many zeros and ones? More. You see where we're going? Okay. All right. So what's really cool is that when you have this entanglement happening, it's happening at a distance. Okay? This is not so okay. I'm saying this is a trick question. So Imagine this crazy thing, that ex across the expanse of the universe, you can actually have more and more entangled qubits. This is insane for me. This is what? It's like telepathy, yes. Have you guys ever read, there, there's this book, which I'm forgetting, where they talk about ansibles? Um, that's a sci-fi book, which I'm forgetting now. But the point is, um, this what sounds like telepathy. Einstein hated it. Einstein called this stuff spooky action at a distance. There's no way that two things that are separated across the distance of the universe could be so entangled that if I screw around with one thing on this side, that the other thing will be also reacting. Nuh-uh, can't happen. Cannot happen. Because it wouldn't work. And he couldn't explain how it would work unless thinking about, like, telepathy. Which, by the way, may also be a thing, but that's another story. 
But um, so what Ronald Hansen did, and you can like look for this article. It's actually very readable, by the way. There is also a really good YouTube video that explains this phenomenon much better than I'm doing now with my fingers, uh, with like little uh, balls and stuff. Um, and the YouTube video is regarding this loophole-free bell test. Loophole-free bell test. And what it does is it shows you how this entanglement at a distance is actually accomplishable and what it means. And the clue is that when you can prove this, you have proved Einstein wrong. So what they did is they took two entangled photons. They separated them at a distance of about four kilometers between two parts of TU Delft University. And they proved that when they change the photons on the one side, they would affect those that were entangled on the other. Yeah, so that thing that was not supposed to be possible before was experiments that were previously done, but they always had built-in loopholes because that meant like, hey, we've observed this phenomenon, but maybe we can explain it because there was some local noise. Or maybe we hadn't really, you know, uh, accounted for other variations that it could have affected this. So, and this time, they took all of these things in account and it was loophole free. So this is really what happened. And that's why it was published in Nature and it's published by Ronald Hansen. Anyway, we're working with this amazing professor to actually look at how to demonstrate the use of QKD for uh, information security. So other properties of quantum mechanics and quantum computing that you need to know is when you have regular bits and regular traffic, what we can do is we know that those things are pretty robust. In quantum computing, they're not so robust. They're actually really fragile at the moment, especially when you work with physical qubits. They can be interrupted and screwed around with because of noise. But really what's so interesting is in quantum mechanics, we know that if there is someone trying to like observe this, like when, when someone's trying to observe your traffic, do you notice when they're intercepting you? You're my terrorist guy, so that's what I'm asking. Yeah, no, right? You don't know. You don't know when Cambridge Analytica is looking at your stuff. But the clue is you can know when they're trying to do it on a quantum state. You must know because there is a huge influence of this observer. It's very fragile, this state. So when someone else is trying to touch it, you see it. The second thing is when we have uh, information packets that are being sent across the wire, we can do something called a replay attack, right? You can just replay the stream of traffic, and it's no problem. But you can't clone this on quantum computing. There's no possibility to do a replay attack. Do you guys know what a replay attack is? OK, I see a lot. You, your nod's good. OK, just making sure. And then when we think about a quantum computer, well, we also realize this is for the architect in the room. You're the architect, right? Yes, good. There's actually three different architectures. Actually, there's more than three, because when you actually get down to it, there are different topological uh, architects for, uh, architectures for a quantum computer. But the ones we refer to are a quantum annealer, which is the easiest one to do, an analog quantum computer, which means that you can actually have a sort of intermediary between a full quantum computer and the analog one. And then you have, and she's escaping now. So, and and um, then you have the universal quantum computer. This is the one that's going to win the Nobel Prize. Whoever gets here first is going to win the quantum arms race that is now going on all over the world. And the universal quantum computer is the thing that like IBM is trying to produce, Google is trying to produce, you know, Microsoft has a huge investment in this. There's all kinds of universities all over the world and the biggest amount of money that's working on this project is from China. So, this is the granddaddy of it. Ooh. And what, you know, why are we worried? Why do we even give a damn about quantum computing? It's because when we look at computing architectures, the largest computer in the world right now is a supercomputer in China. If we want to double the power of that supercomputer in China, what do we have to do? We've got to build another supercomputer. What do you have to do when you want to double the size of a quantum computer? Add one qubit. And that's why the power of this is so amazingly cool, because it's easier to add one more qubit than to invest billions to build another supercomputer next to the one you've already got. 
So when we talk about scale, everybody knows about Moore's law, but the law that's applying here is Amdahl's law, which says even with our current topologies, when we keep adding more and more processor power, it doesn't actually lead to that exponential rise in computing power. So more and more processors, you know, more, 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 more. But actually, it's actually going to wean and taper off. So instead of having that rise, like the hockey stick going on high, we're actually going to kind of see that a little bit. It's going to wean off. And that's why we need to rethink how we do all of our architecture anyway. When, it, when we talk about, like, OK, what's the power of this? So we build this massive computer, and then what? So what? Then there are two guys that you need to remember, Shore and Grover. Peter Shore already thought about cool algorithms that he could use if there was such a thing as quantum computers. And the reason is because who knows anything about cryptography? Good. So you know that. Our current cryptography is based on really difficult math problems. Do you, do you know which two math problems? Integer factorization? Bueno, discrete logarithms. That's the wrong language. Um, bueno. Um, yes, so those two difficult math problems. Integer factorization means uh, basically when you multiply things, you know, like you multiply things, you have a product, right? Everybody knows this. OK? But integer factorization means that you can reverse this equation. We call it reversing a one-way function. So uh, an example uh, that I always use, because it works on this for some unknown reason, these two numbers always work. What's 8 times 9? What's 8 times 9? Guy named Blue Shirt who's going like this. What? 8 times 9 is not 91. Try again. Huh? No. What? Sorry? No, guys, what's 8 times 9? Come on. 72. Right. Thank you. Sorry. I didn't want to embarrass you. Um, OK, so now tell me all of the factors that you could multiply to get to 72. S silence. No, no, it's good. It's good. I like this. This was my illustration. My point is it's easier to multiply 8 times 9 than to reverse it the other way around to figure out what products could I have done, or what things could I have multiplied, rather, to get to that product 72. Okay, So we reverse that one-way function. We have a hard time with it, but so do our current computers. But a quantum computer can be like and be very OK, that's the sound effect. But can be very quick with actually how it gets to these integer factorization. It actually knows how to factor all those integers. And that's what Peter Schroer's algorithm does. And Grover then does like searching through a large database, and it sorts it very efficiently, which means that you can look for all of the poti potential combinations to result in that answer. The same thing holds true for discrete logs. So before I dis explain discrete logs without having a sort of, it's also known as clock uh, arithmetic, but it, it's the same thing. It's easy to do in one way, difficult to reverse the other way. This problem is the basis of all of our current asymmetric cryptography. And what we do is we don't do 8 times 9. We do very, very large prime number multiplication. So Gaussian mathematics. Large prime numbers multiplied by each other. Another large number. Hard to figure out which primes actually initiated this equation. You guys get it? All right. This is why cryptographers are nervous about quantum computing. Because if you can do this, problems that once took the lifetime of the universe to calculate with our current computing and supercomputing architecture could potentially take seconds. OK? Seconds. So uh, depending on the algorithm you're using and the key length you're using, the time differential can be calculated, like how exactly how long does it take. But no matter what, there is a drastic reduction in the amount of effort that is required to get to the answer. So what we always say, uh, or at least my strategy for this is, first and foremost, if we know we've got this problem, first thing you can do is increase the length of your current crypto. Second thing you can do is look for something called quantum key distribution, which you can place in your network. Oh, I'm already, OK. I'm really out of time. Um, uh, to look for long-term secrecy. And then you can look at post-quantum algorithms to look at how you're going to actually deploy it. To go really quickly, because I'm really out of time, 
the NSA has advice about what your key length should be. Depending on the algorithms that you're using, you just use, if you use AES, you use 256-bit keys, which is the most you can do with an AES algorithm. If you uh, have spots in your network where you know you've got two people communicating, you make sure that that channel is super, super strong by creating a quantum channel in between. What it really means is that between Alice and Bob, there's lasers and photons being shot at, which can be actually measured for interruption by an evil eavesdropper. Okay? If the NSA is monitoring you, you will see it if you use a quantum link. We actually do this, and it looks like when it's a product-based, it looks like this. But what we're now building is a four-node uh, quantum internet backbone in the Netherlands, and it actually looks like this. And it's not pretty, it's really messy, but it's funky as hell, and this is the future. We, by the way, we need developers to help us figure out how to build this. It's all Python stuff. We're also working out what do you do when you don't have fiber connections in between and you're trying to do this over free space. There's an Italian researcher at the University of Genoa, Paolo Villarese, and he actually did this experiment between Las Palmas and Tenerife to build something over free space between these two islands. It's awesome work because what's really awesome is when you can do that, not across two islands, but from low Earth orbit. The Chinese launched their first satellite. They're now doing quantum communications in low Earth orbit and instead of having four little tiny nodes in the Netherlands, are building a 2,000 long kilometer network in China. That means no matter who has a quantum computer, the Chinese communications is always safe. That should terrify you, if nothing else. What do we have? What do we have in Europe? What do you have? The EU has produced a quantum manifesto to try to figure out how to deal with it. It's one of the flagships for the EU. They give subsidies to companies, developers, universities to work together to come up with a solution. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. I was part of the high-level steering committee that actually established this project. We have four areas, communication, computation, simulation, and meteorology. Fundamental area, engineering, and software. We need developers. So I won't talk to you about this, but there's areas of quantum communication. Obviously, building a new quantum computer is a big part of this project, so quantum computing, uh, trying to figure out how to simulate problems before we have a quantum computer available, and quantum sensing and meteorology. So the final thing, the only real solution that I really believe in is new sets of algorithms. NIST has initiated a call for post-quantum cryptographic algorithms that will have a new set of math problems behind them that won't be as easily solvable with a quantum computer. And that's the only thing that will work at internet scale. So really, we're just getting started. Uh, you know, IBM has the public access quantum computer. You can all get an account on there now. Uh, we're looking for Python developers to help us with some of the back-end stuff that's going on here. It's, really exciting times. Google has invented a 72-qubit uh, quantum processor, which has a lot of hope that's now being in trial testing. You know, and we really also need a common way forward, because that is something we're fundamentally missing, other than having this quantum manifesto, fundamentally missing in Europe. And what would be terrible is, instead of actually working together for real solutions that actually work, that we have a sort of Eurovision song festival, and that we all vote for each other because, hey, Inclusion. So I urge you to take a look to try this out because this is part of our secure future. Thank you so much.